Thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks for a very moving talk. It's uh, quite difficult to know what to say to, uh, to, to, to follow that experience. Um, I guess what, what I'm talking about um, attempts to offer a flip side of that in the recognising that although um, uh, death and bereavement are traumatic themes, but there is a role that archaeology can play to turn things um, turn things on their, their head a little bit and to provide a different avenue and a different route, route for some people. Um, so to add a bit of a, a context, I've been um, looking at funerary archaeology for as long as I can, I can remember. Um, and you do become quite desensitised to it. You get used to thinking about plastered skulls or defleshing human skeletons in a very archaeological sense. And I, I think you're absolutely right, but when you're dealing with the bones, the dry bones, it's a lot easier than when you're thinking about the, the flesh body. I think that's a, a kind of recurring thing. Um, but a few years ago, no, I got to thinking about how um, whether the funerary archaeology that I was interested in can be um, used to, to think differently about the archaeology we do today um, uh, and about how archaeology can give something back to contemporary society, which is when I started thinking about the role that archaeology might be able to play in thinking about death and bereavement today and, um, and grief today. Um, so um, I'm just going to talk uh, briefly about some of the, the projects I've been involved in, uh, Continuing Bonds, uh, Dying to Talk and Breathe, all collaborative projects, all interdisciplinary. Uh, that's a really important strand. Um, um, I have got a bit of a trigger warning, but I don't, probably don't need it after the last talk. Um, so um, there is some images of human remains, uh, but mostly like you see, see in museums. Um, so the, the context for the research I've been doing is the fact that more and more people are aware that we're going to die before it happens because of the uh, advances in medical care. Um, uh, and um, because of the advances of medical care, um, we experience uh, fewer sudden deaths. More people know ahead of a time that it's coming. Um, and yet, this, um, everything from the World Health Organization to the NHS and the Dying Matters um, Coalition recognise that um, in order to facilitate more better deaths, that one of the things we need is to be open and to talk about death and to normalise it and to accept that Death, um, for many people, is a natural part of the life course and not some kind of failure of, uh, failure of medical science. Um, and um, that got me thinking about how archaeology might be, might be used um, in this respect. Um, archaeology is, um, often deals with the distant past. And I had this idea that uh, we could use some of the case studies from the past of the very different ways that people have dealt with death through time to get people talking and to facilitate those difficult conversations about death and bereavement today. Um, so with this idea in mind, I approached some, some colleagues in um, first in Manchester and then in Bradford who were working in end of life care and kind of started to float the idea with them. And they encouraged me to go to the Palliative Care, care Congress in, um, in Harrogate in 2014. I think I was the first archaeologist that had often, uh, ever gone to a, a palliative care congress <laughs> meeting. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and I uh, presented a poster on whether archaeology can make a difference and it won a poster yeah. prize. I've never won anything in my life. So that kind of gave me the green light that this, this could be um, a useful avenue. Uh, not least in the um, a cheap B&B &B down the road, I was sat having breakfast and the woman next to me was absolutely lovely. We started talking about my ideas and then I realised she was like some big professor in palliative medicine. And if I'd known who she was, I probably would have been too scared to talk to her. So she became my collaborator from, from then on. Um, so this um, uh, then led to various other collaborations. I was part of an um, Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, crossing over network where we worked with a, a group of us, um, archaeologists, sociologists, English literature, creative writing, and we ran some uh, workshops in a hospice with hospice workers and volunteers, and we focused on objects, 
starting from the archaeological, how we understand what we do about, about objects, uh, thinking particularly about grave goods and heirlooms and objects that have been passed on. And this went into thinking about how um, hospice staff use objects in their own work. Um, and then that created a piece of um, uh, creative writing and poetry led by the English li literature side. Um, so it was a real experimental um, avenue and it, and it worked really well. And what I was seeing through all of this is the idea that yes, this was working. We also worked with uh, Sir Natalo in Leicester. Um, we had a bit of a pilot project where we put posters up around public spaces in Leicester uh, that focused on different parts of archaeology and funerary archaeology. And we kind of um, watched what was happening. So we, um, we, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> watched what was happening. Um, and we, we realised that in a very short space of time, it was in, in a pub in a, uh, a bar in Leicester on a Friday night, we had pictures of like plaster skulls there and we watched what happened. And very quickly people moved from talking about the, the quite interesting and fascinating material on the, on the posters, to then talking about what happens today, to then talking about their own, their great Aunt Mabel, their own expectations, fears, worries, really quickly, often within a matter of minutes, in a way that if we'd just gone on to them, up to them on a Friday night in a pub and say, do you want to talk about this? We might have got like a whole, whole different response of barriers would have come out. So this was a pilot study to thinking about the role that archaeology can play in facilitating those conversations, which then led to us the Continuing Bonds project, which is really trying to create an evidence base for thinking about this hypothesis of using the past to facilitate talking about death and bereavement and normalising um, talk of the dead. Um, so again, this was a collaboration between archaeology, end of life care and psychology, where we ran workshops um, in Leicester and Bradford, primarily with health and social care professionals and students, um, where we exposed them to various archaeological um, uh, materials from, from space, um, not from space, sorry, from around the world and through time, <laughs> uh, different regions, um, different media, mostly images, but also some videos, some tangible objects and artifacts. Um, uh, designed to get people thinking about uh, a wide range of archaeological material and we got them to think about their own expectations, reactions to it, their thoughts. Uh, most of the archaeological materials were put together by uh, Lindsay Booster. Um, on the flip side of the pictures there'd be a bit more text and a bit more detail and we kind of um, uh, heavily questionnaire them. We had a pre-workshop, post-workshop questionnaire a follow-up one and we did some interviews uh, with some people as well to try and actually reflect on what difference being exposed to the archaeology actually made. Um, there was eight different workshop themes, all of which contained uh, three to five sub-themes within it on a range of different, um, uh, different uh, topics. Um, and we had that kind of influence from archaeology coming through, whether it's think about personhood or identity or choice, place. Um, and they were hanging off the idea of continuing bonds through time. Um, I'm just gonna flip my slides around slightly. Um, so there was an idea that in, um, in um, psychology and counseling sociology, but people were moving away from the idea of detachment theory, where you could nicely work through the, the steps of grief to come out at the other end, sort of grief as a linear process, to accepting that often when you're bereaved, the dead still stay with you. They still carry on to um, have a place in your life. It's just a changed position, a changed relationship between the living and the dead. So someone's death isn't necessarily the end of their role in your life, and that's okay to still remember the dead, to still talk of the dead, to still talk to the dead. And this is often happens uh, what's in what's called continuing bonds. Or the idea that indeed the grieving process has fluctuations between acceptance and loss. It's not a nice linear process. Um, and this quote sums it up nicely. When your loved one dies, grief isn't about working through a linear process that ends with acceptance of a new life, where one has moved on or compartmentalised your loved one's memory. Um, Rather, you find ways to adjust and redefine your relationship with that person, allowing for a continued 
bond um, that will endure throughout your life. Um, so we looked at this theme of uh, continuing bonds and looked at examples of this through space and time. I've just got a couple of, of some of the, the materials that provoked some of the biggest responses for our, and our workshop participants. Uh, this one of, um, uh, from Indonesia, where um, people are kept in their home often for some time um, after their, their death. And then when they they're still seem to be sleeping until they're um, removed from the house. And you can see here this engagement with the dead body is something that we're not, we're not used to. The very visible, almost mummified uh, grandmother there. And people were a bit shocked with the kind of, the kind of selfie culture that's going alongside it, that kind of mix of the, the contemporary and, and the, the traditional. Um, and things like this dinner service that was created um, using powdered um, human bones as part of a glaze. Uh, it's actually created by, by an artist. Um, but this, people found this really troubling. Um, but we didn't think about kind of bone china and what's in that. And it, cre it created kind of quite um, in-depth discussions that got people to really challenge what they think of as right or normal. And indeed, these um, bone otteries really provoke that sense of what constitutes respect for the dead. Um, what's the right way to go about things? Is this okay? There was one person that said it didn't seem right to break up the body like this but then went on to say that she wanted to be cremated and her ashes scattered. And these are the kinds of oppositions that we hold in our head without really thinking about it. So one of the, the outcomes of the, the project was A, it did get people, it did normalise talking about death and bereavement, but it also got people to challenge what they thought of as right or normal in terms of um, grief and bereavement. Um, so some of our findings, Um, most of our participants um, um, really felt that, um, that use of the archaeological materials in this way was valuable. I'll just go through these uh, quite quickly. Um, and that most of them, 83% of them, agreed that it made them think differently about uh, death and bereavement. And um, this is something that's still involving um, getting people to think how the um, participating in this would impact on their professional um, practice. And this was a real eye-opener for me because when I came along um, as, an, as an archaeologist, I was quite keen to measure the difference that we made to people's professional lives. And it was only through working on the project that I realised that actually this distinction between personal and professional was a bit flawed. And that kind of what needed to happen to have professional change was at first you needed to see that personal change. You needed a change in personal values, attitudes and beliefs, which would then filter through to professional change, rather than jumping straight in at the, the deep end and expecting to see a professional uh, uh, development. Uh, so that was quite, quite interesting. Um, and again, we did see that um, people felt that there was a space place to talk. And it was sharing of a uh, of experiences as well that helped to normalise what people were going through. So one person said that until the workshop she never talked about this. She had a job, a jar of Horlicks um, in her cupboard for five years because the last thing that um, her mother had, had given her. Um, and it was uh, when, she, when she eventually got rid of it. But actually when she said it at the workshop, everyone in her group said, oh, it could really identify it. Someone hadn't been able to get it pair of shoes and this idea of a, a limited coil of, of problematic stuff and actually getting people to talk about it then made people realise that actually what they were going through wasn't odd or weird or any of the, you know, the, the barriers that they'd, they'd felt. Um, and it was kind of seeing the different ways that people dealt with grief through, through the past that really helped in that process of, of challenging the normal and normalising what, what we actually do. Um, we try to kind of build up a bit of a, a chart about how we think this all works and we think it's really important to create a safe space where people could talk where they knew what to, to expect but also we create, provided some quite challenging materials. We created some kind of cognitive dis dissonance in a way 
um, which then got people um, talking, it got them sharing, examining their practices, which then led to an impact on how they thought, which then we hope is going to lead to a change in their personal and professional um, practices and experiences. Um, it was really interesting, the idea of um, providing quite challenging materials as well. At the outset of our project, uh, uh, Jenny Days, who is our, um, one of the um, postdocs on the project, who's from a psychology background, um, was um, saying that, you know, she didn't feel comfortable in, in shocking people um, through the materials. Uh, but then through witnessing, I mean, we didn't set out to shock, but some of the materials we chose, like the, the bonosuries or that, um, uh, the, the crockery, we knew would kind of unsettle people. And then kind of through the project, she kind of looked back and she saw that actually the biggest shifts came about through creating, that, it got people thinking in a different way. Um, and I think it's, you know, you, you remember and you learn and it's part of that, that process. Um, the Continuing Bonds project finished um, just, over, just over a year ago. Um, we've had a few follow-up projects, some during and some since. We've also, we've used um, the experiences of our work, of our participants along with case studies from the past in um, a series of creative writing workshops, Continuing Bonds Creative Disseminations uh, with uh, Melanie Giles in, in Manchester and um, Andy Holland was a, a project assistant too. And we created, uh, so basically these were um, members of the public came along to creative writing workshops um, and created a joint anthology. Some of them hadn't written uh, poetry or creative writing in their lives, uh, but the whole idea was that it was all based around funerary archeology span and, um, and experience of bereavement. Again, with the idea of normalizing talking about death and bereavement. Through the, through the involvement in the project. Um, we also ran a Dying to Talk project with um, school, uh, with, with young people in Bradford, um, where we um, co-produced a video by young people for young people aimed at um, getting them to talk about um, um, bereavement. Um, if we've got time at the end of my talk, I'll play you two, yeah, two minutes of it. Yeah, um, and, <laughs> um, and we uh, then um, had two festival of, festivals of the dead with um, local schools in Bradford, where we, uh, the video is designed with discussion <coughs> points in it, and then we had a load of um, hands-on activities to get people um, engage so it's design your own David dead mask, design your own coffin, create your own cremation tattoo. Uh, they didn't really tattoo them, it's based on. Um, and the idea behind that is that when people are involved in those craft activities, they're more, more likely to talk because they haven't got that eye to eye contact. So it's kind of quite a, a levelling experience. And that was exa exactly the case. Um, they were able to, um, to talk about their, their experience through the activities. So this was amongst uh, school pupils and we had uh, great feedback from the teachers and basically we need to, to do more of it. And then um, uh, finally, um, the work with um, thinking about difficult conversations has then fed into work that I'm involved with at the moment with my colleagues at Bradford, again from archeology, span from um, um, heritage and digital heritage and peace studies, where we've been looking at the value of um, heritage for well-being, for psychosocial support and for social cohesion. And we've been focused out in Jordan, in, in Azraq for this partly a serendipitous event in that my uh, um, partner and Adrian Evans is PI had already been working with the Jordan Museum out there and with a local group called uh, Jordan Heritage. So we already had, had connections. And here we've been um, working in Azraq 
uh, refugee camp in North Syria in Village 5 with, um, with our project partners, Mercy Corps, being humanitarian aid um, people. And um, we've had, um, we started off with some virtual reality recreations of, of heritage sites uh, from Syria. Um, this is Syrian refugees in, um, uh, in, in Jordan, uh, in the camp. Um, and they're mostly, we're working in Village 5, which is an area of high security where they're essentially not allowed to leave their area, their compound has got a high fence around it. They're not allowed to leave, they're essentially imprisoned. Um, and um, what we've done is run um, some, some workshops first to introduce ourselves and to try and gain a sense of what they were interested in seeing in virtual reality. And then um, using uh, web scraped uh, technology, uh, which I know a little about, but I don't know knows more about than I do, um, recreated some of those sites in virtual reality. Uh, the sites that the, the, um, the refugees had, had requested. We then ran a cultural heritage festival over two days with our partners in the camp, where we um, again showcased some of the virtual reality of the sites they'd asked for, um, but also some of it was more monumental, like as a um, uh, Aleppo castle. Much of it was the more everyday, like um, souks, so the market marketplaces. Sorry, it's a pain for your filming because I keep thinking of it. <laughs> um, uh, more everyday places, um, and this was. Um, the virtual reality environments were used to kind of spark conversations, um, but it was part of a bigger event. So it wasn't just about the virtual reality, it was about food, music, uh, dancing, and we had a big cultural her heritage event. And we just went back um, a month later to try and get some perspectives of how it had gone. And we got some really incredible feedback. So um, one woman was saying that she put the virtual reality on her daughter, who was only uh, two or three when they'd left Syria. Um, and she didn't think that her daughter remembered much of Syria. She'd put the VR on, and when we were back that night, her daughter starts telling her all these memories she could remember about Syria. We had one woman that said that she'd try to repress memories, and then seeing them in VR reminded her that she was Syrian and she was proud of that heritage, and she that was part of her identity, and she wanted to remember it. But the, the most kind of touching thing for us and the, the part of the project was about um, social cohesion was the, in the women's group when they were feeding back, they were saying that they had no idea before the Cultural Heritage Festival about the different aspects of their Syrian identity, particularly around food. So since, um, since the event, they'd started sharing uh, different recipes with each other, they didn't realise they had different dialects for some of the same food or cooking implements. They're saying they've got four different um, words for nose amongst their student colleagues. And they said that they're now creating new families amongst their neighbours in the refugee camps, which is kind of, you know, they're in a desperate situation, but it's creating new relationships through, through the, inspired by the heritage, but it's actually strengthening their resilience uh, to get through the the, the next few years that, that lie ahead of them. Um, so, um, so just finally, uh, just to, to overview, it's, we've been thinking about um, how to tackle different topics uh, through the archaeology, about the value of heritage for building resilience and cohesion, and thinking about the impact this has on us as researchers and students and archaeologists. Although we need to take care of ourselves, we're finding that being able to give something back and turn what we're doing to, to positive contemporary use is kind of really valuable. And we're trying to find more and more ways to, to capture that and to demonstrate the value of this and to empower people to realise that mostly as archaeologists, what we do is dealing with this sort of thing. You've probably all encountered it yourselves where you start talking about a dig and people will start talking about the topic and about kind of trying to equip ourselves with the skills to embrace that rather than to, to, sh to shy away for, from it. Um, and we've also been thinking more holistically about the journey between researchers, field 
archaeologists and students. I've been working with, with Hannah Cobb um, with thinking about how to think differently about equipping our students with um, and empowering our students to think differently about the past um, and its role today. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. <laughs>